please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Uh, you know, over the course of the past 24 hours, we've heard a lot of what is working for India. Uh, we're growing at about 7%, a little over 7% today. That's the kind of growth rate that we've seen over the past decade. Macros uh, perhaps looking a little less favorable than they were over the last three years. On the basis of the parameters that you track, and you have 10 ways of identifying whether a nation is rising or falling, uh, in 2018, how does India look to you? Right. You know, my consistent narrative about India, and this is something that we have spoken about in the past, is that ever since I've sort of been tracking this for the last 25 years closely, is that this is a country that consistently disappoints the optimists and the pessimists. So if you get too lost with one narrative, uh, you're likely to fail in India. Mm. I think that what we have seen basically is the fact that a couple of years ago, there was a lot of optimism, almost as if like, it was only a matter of time before we would get to 8 to 10% economic growth. And that really hasn't happened. Mm. Now, I think we are sort of entering a very critical period where I think that it, um, the global economy is doing well. Yes. But as far as India is concerned, it's not been able to fully participate in this massive global economic revival that we have seen over the past... Uh, 18 months or so. What's gone wrong? Well, I think there are two or three factors. They're the obvious ones which we have spoken about, um, about demonetization and the teething problems with GST. But I think that the one sort of really big problem which hasn't been fixed in India, and if you look at it, that if you look at all the major econ economies in the world, when they went through uh, some sort of a banking crisis, mm. until the banking system was fixed, it was very difficult for those countries to get back to their full potential. This goes back to Italy, to the, to the United States. So the banking system, the financial system is really the archery. It lies at the heart of what um, a nation can do and in terms of what its growth rate is. And that for me has been the single biggest shortcoming of the last few years. It's been the biggest missed opportunity. You believe that the government should have exercised the political majority it enjoys to be able to drive through banking reforms, which in your mind means privatization. Yeah, because, you know, I think there's been a, a lot of debate about privatization and, and whether that's the, that's the thing to do or not to do, and all sorts of ideological debates have come about. For me, it's a very simple number which tells you about really what's going on out here, which is that in India, like as you know now, about two-thirds of the assets are, are with the public sector banks. This is the highest of any democratic country in the world. The average across emerging markets is about one-third mm. in terms of what it is. So every country needs a public sector to meet some social objectives. But there is no country like India where the figure is this lopsided. So I think that, for me, that's the issue. It's not about public versus private. It's sure. about a balance. That in the banking system, the average number in which the share is there across the world, is about one-third, and India's at two-thirds. And there's a side effect to this, which is that if you look at all the incremental economic, act, uh, the financial activity, it's all happening through the private sector banking, mm. in terms of whether it's got to do with trade finance, credit cards, the massive retail lending that we are seeing, a bulk of it is happening through the private sector banks anyway. So what India is seeing is really privatization by malign neglect. Mm. That it's not happening explicitly, but the banking system is being privatized, but it's happening at a huge cost. Whereas the public sector banks are not only being destroyed in value, but it's also choking the economic recovery. And for me, the single biggest fear just now um, in India, if you ask me what is the biggest risk to India in 2018, yeah. I think the single biggest risk to India, if you ask me currently, is the fact that, the, that we have a regulatory overkill that we have seen the, so, you know, like we have seen this... Are we likely to see a regulatory overkill or we are already seeing a regulatory overkill? I think we are already seeing parts of it. Okay. And this is, you know, like already manifesting itself in many ways. Now, I do believe that many public sector banks are going to be completely frozen to lend, given the sort of regulatory overkill that we are seeing currently, which so is that... So you believe that there is going to be a credit freeze? Not a credit freeze, because the private sector banks have taken such an increased share, and I think that they will keep lending. <laughs> But there are many sort of side effects of this. The first side effect is that the access to credit is going to get more and more directed towards the big companies with established credits, mm. right? So a problem in India in the last few years, and this is a global problem, but it's been sort of accentuated in India, is that the big have gotten bigger. So if you look at companies in each sector, 
the top companies have just kept gaining market share at the cost of the smaller companies. Mm. And when you have this type of a credit environment, it's the small and medium-sized businesses which get hurt the most when you have a, you know, like the sort of risk aversion which sets through. And a lot of the private sector banks will be able to lend, but a lot of the public sector banks are going to be really frozen. And even the private sector banks are going to be much more cautious about who we are lending to, what the credits are, because the cost now of making a bad loan has gone up a lot. It's almost become like a criminal offense. Mm. And I think that this is what India has to be careful about, which is that we, ha we have to avoid this temptation for regulatory overkill. And this has already been playing, its out, uh, playing itself out in many ways. Okay. One is the banking sector. The other statistic which I find, you know, which is what we just came up with, which I find quite staggering is that since 2014, 23,000 millionaires have left this country. 23,000 yeah. millionaires have left India since yeah. 2014. Yes. Okay. And in terms of, like you notice, in terms of what's, what's going on here, and to put this in a global perspective, last year, 7,000 millionaires left this country, the largest number uh, in recent times. Mm -hmm. The year before that, it was 4,000. So the number is going up mm. of the number of millionaires leaving this country. In absolute terms, this is still behind China, but as a share of total millionaires leaving this country, this is the largest of any major nation in the world. So that, there, you know, so we're seeing How this. How do you explain that? Well, I, well, of course, some will say this is a good thing, that this is an anti-corruption drive and we're driving all the corrupt away. But I think that there's a major side effect of this, which is that at the end of the day, you need your own domestic people to invest in your country. I think that is very important. You know, foreign investment is important, but it's really domestic sort of participation, domestic investors, who sort of make a nation going forward. So I think that, to me, this has to be really sort of looked into, mm. that why are so many millionaires leaving this country? And if you're happy about it, because you think this is part of the anti-corruption drive, fair enough. But when, you are, when the number is the highest in the world, at least as a share of total millionaires leaving the country, that should be a cause for concern. Well, that's a significant headline that you've given us, Richard, that uh, India has the highest number of millionaires uh, leaving the country. And you know, since you talked about domestic investment, uh, yesterday we, we had uh, a, a session here with business leaders and Deep Kalra, who uh, in a sense is part of the startup ecosystem and of course uh, has now been around for more than a decade. His point was that India has taken Atiti Devo Bhava to a whole entire level, where you're welcoming foreign direct investment, you're welcoming foreign companies, but at the cost of domestic entrepreneurs, domestic entrepreneurship, and not providing a level playing field. Does this number that you just gave us, uh, in your mind, also perhaps have something to do with, with the point that Deep made? Yeah, I think so. I think that that's absolutely true because, you know, like you go to Dubai today and like you're likely to meet more Indians out there than you're <laughs> likely to meet in a restaurant in, uh, like in Delhi. Bombay or Delhi or something like that. You know, like so you can see as to where the capital is fleeing, what the magnets for capital are, Dubai, Singapore, of course, back in like the US and UK. So that I think is definitely the point. But you know, as I say about India, that what's fascinating for me, um, I wear many hats. One of them is a, that of a foreign investor as well. Yes. What's fascinating about this country is that how this, how this country keeps on rising. Mm. So in fact, I know that your thing is India rising. My thing is that this country is forever rising, you know, whatever you want to sort of make out of it, right? So that it's on a continuous sort of upward march, but, the, but it's a sort of chaotic march. Mm. And, and for every sort of positive story, there's a negative story. So um, what's happening in India, as you said, many domestic sort of people are leaving, but, and also the fact that the bigger are getting bigger. Mm. But this also remains a dream for investors like us. Mm. And um, why do I say that? The highest number of quality companies in the world, in any developing country, but I'd say in the world, at least as a share, we find in India. Mm -hmm. Over the last five years, there have been about, I think about 70 companies in India with a sort of market cap of at least a billion dollars, which have doubled in value. You don't get that kind of sort of richness in other uh, sort of emerging markets. In mm. places like Br Brazil, we can find 10, 20. Russia, we can barely find half a dozen. Mm. So on one side, you have this crony capitalism, yeah. uh, you know, which sort of is out in all its ugly display. On the other side, you have this, these incredibly good Indian companies that have given a lot of value back to investors. 
and they're very high quality in terms of, if, if you look at the metrics like return on equity, um, consistent earnings growth, India ranks right up there mm -hmm. compared to any nation in the world if you take it as a share of the total companies listed out here, which is quite large. So it's, an, it's a country that we always want to be engaged with. Sure. But obviously, we keep looking at the fact that what more could be done for India to have, you know, become like the next China. That's really been the sort of dream of so many of us who have sort of been studying development economics and who've been in awe of China's rise since the 1990s. And there I find that no matter what happens, no matter what the politics is, we consistently sort of uh, disappoint in terms of being the next China.